financially. You know, in other words, uh, making bad spending choices, you know, misusing um, debt, all that kind of stuff. I think it's impossible to be out of whack financially and in sync with your heavenly father. And so so what I'm saying is I, I actually don't think you can be a follower of Jesus, be in sync with Jesus and be upside down financially. Now, you might well be sitting there listening to this thinking, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that's a bit hard. Are you telling me it's tough to be a follower of Jesus and be upside down financially? I'm not sure I can I can actually uh, agree with that, Duncan. But here's why I say it, because Jesus said something similar. In fact, when he said it in the Sermon on the Mount, he caused so much tension in his audience. So this is what he says. Oh, you see, you know what's happened? It says this meeting, this is why it's a problem, Io. Oh. Because my screen has just come up and said this meeting is being live streamed and now I can't move my cursor and I can't find my cursor at all. Um, so it's just this, this, it says this meeting is being live streamed by staying in this meeting, you consent to be in live streamed and I can't, I can't find my cursor and I can't make it move or change or anything. You want me to um, run the slides for you, Duncan? Oh, that goes that way. See, I've gone back now. I don't know what's going on here. Oh, hang on, found my, there we go. Right. Honestly, this is like <laughs> Mickey Mouse show, isn't it? There we go. Let me try it, let me try it all over again. We got that far, didn't we? So let me just try and, I'm so sorry. So let me just try that again. Here we go. Good. So as long as no other messages come up on the screen, we should be okay. Can you see that screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Right. I am so sorry about that. So you might think that that statement's a bit hard, but look, this is what Jesus said to his crowd on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six. He says, for where your treasure is, in other words, where your stuff is, where your money is, there your heart will be also. also. So in other words, if you want to know how my heart is doing, if you're sitting there thinking, I wonder how Duncan's doing spiritually, then don't judge it by the fact that I'm preaching to you tonight. Don't judge it by the fact that I'm a director of a Christian charity. Don't judge it by the fact that I would call myself a pastor. Judge how I'm doing spiritually, how my heart is doing by looking at my credit card statement, by looking at my bank statement. You know, but you might say, well, Duncan, you know, he knows his Bible so well. He must be really hot spiritually. And God would say, ah, not so much, not so much. Um, you need to look at his bank statement. You need to look at how he spends his money. You need to look at his attitude to his stuff, because that will tell you how he's doing spiritually. Do you see what I'm trying to say? The state of my heart is shown by where my money goes, by where my treasure uh, goes. So, so God, I, you know, I think God says to you and to me, I know that your heart will follow your stuff. I mean, that's how human beings are wired. I know your heart will follow your stuff. But God says, I want your heart. And the only way I'm going to get your heart and to get you to stop following your stuff is if you surrender it to me. You surrender your stuff, your money to me. And you might say, Duncan, for me, that's quite easy. I don't feel attached to my stuff at all. I think, I think it's easy for me to surrender my stuff. Well, here's the test to figure out how good you are at surrendering, surrendering your stuff and how attached you are to your stuff. And the test is simply asking yourself this one question. Is there anything I've bought or that I'm planning to buy in the next few weeks or months that I wouldn't be willing to share or give away? That will tell you how attached you are to your stuff. Is there anything you bought? Is there a new iPad, a new iPhone, a new iWatch? Is there a new car, a holiday home, some new clothes? Is there anything you've bought that you wouldn't be willing to share or give away to somebody else? That will tell you how answering that question honestly will tell you how attached you are to, to your stuff. So you can understand that when Jesus said where you're treasure is there your heart will be also you can understand the tension that caused amongst his audience but then jesus takes it to a whole another level of tension because the next thing he says is no one can serve two masters either you'll hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other and then look what he says you cannot serve both god and money and we say jesus hang on 
surely you mean we can't serve God and the devil. I mean, our conflict every day is between God and the devil, right? And Jesus says, no, not so much. Your, con- your conflict every day is between me and your stuff. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're going to have a master. You're going to have a ruler. And the struggle you have every day is who's going to rule you? Is it your stuff or is it me? So I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're not even a Christian. And you're listening to this. And by the way, if you're not a Christian and you've jumped on this because someone said you should, I am so glad that you're here. And just like I have said, Transformation House is a place that is passionate about creating experiences that people who don't normally come to church just love and want to keep coming back to. So we're really glad that you're here. Or maybe someone sent you the link or the video to look after afterwards. And maybe your your question in your mind is, you know, if I did start becoming a Jesus follower, how can I trust Jesus with my money? Well, here's why I think you can trust Jesus with your money, because I can't think of a single time in the Bible where Jesus ever asks anyone for money. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of a time when Jesus actually asks someone for money. And you might, again, if you're part of Transformation House, you might say, well, if Jesus never asked anybody for money, why does Io ask us for money? Well, there's two answers to that. One, contrary to popular belief, Io is not Jesus. Okay. And number two, the reason that he asks for money is because he likes to see the bills paid around church, the hire and the stuff that's bought. Um, but I just think it's important for us to understand that Jesus doesn't want to want to get hold of your money. That's not the bottom line. Jesus isn't interested in getting hold of your money. The church isn't after your money. Jesus wants to make sure that your money doesn't get a hold of you. Do you see the difference? God doesn't want to have your stuff. He wants to make sure that your stuff doesn't have a grip on you doesn't have a hold on you because when your stuff has you when you're serving your stuff when your stuff has become your master you realize it's a master that never leaves you feeling content so i think we need a new relationship with money and what i'm going to do in the next 15 20 minutes or so is as i'm going to give you three incredibly practical ways in which you can have a brand new relationship with your money maybe things you've never thought of before And what it will do is it will create this beautiful thing that all of us want, this fantastic thing in our financial life called margin. We're all longing for margin. We're longing for this gap between what comes in and what goes out. You know, if each month we were getting a thousand pounds in and we were only spending 800 pounds, we'd have a margin of 200 pounds. And everybody wants that margin. And very few of us ever are ever able to find it. So I want to tell you three practical ways in which you can start finding that margin again in in your life. The first one is this. Here's my first point of of the three. And I'm going to hang around the first one longer and I'll rush through the bottom two a little bit later. But here's the first one. You've got to be knowing where your money's going. You've got to be knowing where your money's going. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen of Transformation House, that means doing a budget. And I can feel you pushing back already. I can feel you saying, oh, no, Duncan, no. Budgeting is so boring. Listen to me. Budgeting is not boring. Budgeting is liberating. Because it gives you this sweet thing called margin between what comes in and what goes out. Budgeting isn't boring. It's liberating. It liberates you to enjoy your spending. So if you've got that gap, if you've got that margin, you can go out and have coffee. You can buy a new hat. You can buy an iWatch because it's in the budget and you can enjoy spending rather than feeling bad that you're putting just something else on the credit card. So budgeting is liberating. It doesn't just liberate you to enjoy your spending. It also liberates you to be generous to others. So the whole Ukraine crisis comes up and you think, oh, I would love to do something to help those people. But I can't because I'm living up to and beyond my means. I have no margin. And we all love being generous, right? There is no greater feeling in the soul of when you can be generous to someone else. And we love that opportunity, but if there's no margin, we can't be. Do you see what I'm saying? Budgeting is liberating because it takes the stress out of everyday life. It takes the stress out of family life. How many times do you as a family argue about money? It even takes the stress out of your marriage and your other relationships. So you've got to be knowing where your money's going. Getting an accurate picture of your current financial situation is paramount. And you can't do it just by going online and looking at your bank statement because you don't know what's coming out next. You might think, oh, I've got 500 pounds in the bank. But tomorrow, all your direct debit goes out and you suddenly have got nothing. The only way to know exactly what's coming in and going out is doing a budget. 
So here's my suggestion. If you've never done this before, just dip your toe in the ocean. Give yourself 14 days and write down everything you spend, everything that goes out for 14 days. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Every coffee you pick up at Starbucks on the way to the office. You know, every Amazon purchase you make, every time you fill the car with petrol, every time you buy some new clothes, every time you go to Tesco or, uh, or Aldi or in our case, Waitrose and do your weekly shop. You know, wherever you go, write down everything for 14 days. I think it will shock you. I've done this with some of my friends who struggle financially. And they said to me, Duncan, I can't believe how much money I spend getting sandwiches every day from petrol stations. You know, it's huge amounts of money. You've got to be knowing where your money's going. So if you do a budget, do it for 14 days, then you'll be knowing where your money's going. Let me tell you something. I'm sure that many of you here have got young kids. You're part of families. This whole issue was so important to me and Debbie. We've got three boys. And as they were growing up, we wanted them to understand how to handle money, probably more than anything else, because we know how destructive bad financial choices can be. So what we did for our family to teach our kids to know where their money is going, we gave them pocket money like every other parent did. But we also gave, they all had three pots each, just little pots. And on one pot, it said give. On one pot, it said spend. And on one pot, it said save. And we gave them their pocket money in small change. And we explained to them what we do as a family. So we said, look, for every pound we get in, we put at least 10p in the give pot. Often it was more, but sometimes it would be at least, the very least, 10p, 10% of what we get in. We would put that into our give pot and we would give it to our local church. And then we'd split the rest between spend and save. So we'd save money because we wanted to go on holiday or because we wanted to update the boiler because the boiler was going to break soon, you know. And then we'd have a spend um, category where we would use it to to pay for the Tesco shopping and going out for a meal and doing other fun things. So we taught our kids they needed to do that. So whenever we went out with our kids shopping, we would always say to them, go get your spend pot. And they would love spending their money. And they would never ask us for toys in toy shops because we would say, have you got the money in your spend pot? Do you see, I wanted to teach my kids that they needed to know where their money is going. And this was so important to us. I made a video about it at two different points in their lives as they were growing up as kids. I made a little video to remind them to to understand this value. And I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you now. because it's illegal but mostly because it's pink yeah i would like to have this much money in real life though oh you never know maybe one day you will but like i keep saying to you boys you've got to be knowing where your money's going we know it, it can't be that hard i'll just put it all in a bank or, or keep it under my bed yeah but then you want to go on a night out and on the way home you want to stop for a bit of dominoes and there's always the girlfriend tax What's the girlfriend tax? So, you'll find out soon, mate. Yeah, yeah, but boys, the point is, sometimes you're not always going to think hard about where you're spending, which is why I say you've got to be knowing where it's all going. And as Ben Lewis Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Well, yes, another 200 quid, please. Uh, I really hate this game. Where's all my money gone? So you've got to be knowing where your money's going. And I tried to teach that to my kids. I mean, they're much older than they, they, they look on that video now. The youngest one there, Joe, he's 19 now. So 
time has moved on, but he still knows that phrase and he still lives um, lives according to those things. So let me get back to that question I asked you right at the start. Who's more content? Um, a man with a million pounds or a man with 10 children? I don't know what you think the answer is. The answer actually is a man with 10 children. Why? Because he doesn't want any more. <laughs> get it? Because he doesn't want any more. So, so let me ask you, what is enough for you? And who's going to decide what is enough for you? I mean, are you going to let the advertisers decide? Oh, I need to get the updated iPhone. I need to get a new car. Are you going to let the advertisers decide what's enough for you? Because they'd be really, really happy to do that job for you. But, but if you're feeling out of control with your money, then maybe I, I would suggest you get into your diary right now and you would find uh, the 2nd of March, Wednesday, the 2nd of March, and you would declare today your enough day. In fact, write this in your diary. Declare it your enough day and write down, I'm going to make my life about something more than just getting more. Today is my enough day. I'm going to make my life so much more than just about acquiring more stuff. So you've got to be knowing where your money's going. That's number one. I'll run through the two and three a lot, a lot quicker. But here's number, here's number two. You've got to throw stuff overboard that you just can't afford. Number one, you've got to be knowing where your money's going. Number two, you've got to throw stuff overboard that you just can't afford. If you're in a financial storm right now, you might just need to be incredibly ruthless and throw some stuff overboard just to stay afloat. You know, if you were in a boat and there was a storm on the high seas and you wanted to stay safe, you're going to have to throw some things overboard to try and lighten the load. It's the same in your financial life. You're going to have to find ways of lightening the load. And that might mean you being absolutely ruthless. You know, maybe you can't afford the mortgage that you've got on your house and you need to downsize so you can get a smaller mortgage. Maybe you need to drive a cheaper car. Maybe you need to eat out less. Maybe you need to um, buy less clothes. Maybe you need to drink coffee at home and not drink coffee in Starbucks or Costa Coffee. You know, I visited a couple uh, in our church a few years ago now who called me because they said, Duncan, we are in desperate financial need. We've made some really bad spending choices and we are sinking financially. And when I went around, they opened all their financial books to me and I looked and they do, I could not believe it. They were spending a thousand pounds a month more than they were getting in. They were 10, 000, they were thousands and thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds in debt. And yet as I sat in their lounge and I looked, I looked around their house, they had Sky TV with all the movies and sport packages. They had brand new iPhones on the drive him and her had a brand new lease car each. And I said, guys, you've got to throw this stuff overboard because you're sinking. You told me you're sinking. You're going to go under. You've got to lighten the load. And they couldn't see it and they didn't want to see it. They wanted to carry on living that way. And I said, you have a choice. You either sink and drown financially or you throw this stuff overboard and you float again. So I don't know what situation you are in, but... I need to ask you, what cargo do you need to throw out in order to stay afloat? I mean, maybe it's a small thing. Maybe you do need to just you know, sell a bit of furniture or cancel your Sky TV package or just drink less Starbucks. Um, but maybe it's bigger things. Maybe you've got to think about financing of cars and mortgages on houses. So, so let me just be brutal, brutally honest and ask you a tough question. But what are you holding on to that's holding you back? What are you holding on to that's holding you back? Maybe it just needs to go overboard so you can stay afloat. You see, Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell combined because he knew how important it is because he wants to be your master, not your stuff. So first way you have a new relationship with money is to know where your money's going. The second way is to throw stuff overboard that you can't afford. And here's the final way. Finally, go shopping with a friend to limit your spend. Go shopping with a friend to limit your spend. If you want to keep out of debt, then you're going to have to rein in that impulse spending, right? Which is why I suggest taking a friend shopping with you. You won't say, oh, yeah, go on, get it. You deserve a treat. It looks great on you. But a real friend will be a good friend and help you limit your spend. 
No, no, none of these three actions are rocket science. Are they? You can do this. You can be knowing where your money is going. You can throw stuff overboard you can't overfall. And you can shop with a friend to limit your spend. And maybe, just maybe for the first time, you can find some real contentment for your life when you create some breathing space in your finances. I know you, even though I can't see your faces, because you're a human being. You want some margin in your financial life because you want to be generous and because you want to enjoy your spending. The only way you're going to find that beautiful thing called margin is if you have a new relationship with money and you know where it's going and you throw stuff overboard that you can't afford and you, you involve others in your financial world. You know, you, you go shopping with a friend who's going to help you to limit your spend. I read a book called The Law of Happiness by a man called Henry Cloud. It must have been a decade ago now. One of my favorite ever books. Henry Cloud is a world-renowned psychologist. And he says this in the book about the law of happiness. Um, he says, when we're pursuing things that don't have the power to make us happy, we're ignoring the ones that do. Honestly, let that sink in for a bit. When you spend your energy pursuing things that really don't have the power to make you happy, but you think they do because the advertisers have told you that they will, you know, the new car smell wears off pretty quickly. But when you spend your life pursuing those things that you think is going to make you happy, all you're doing is ignoring the ones that do. You know, when you get caught up in pursuing things that don't deliver on their promise, you're missing out on the ones that really could. You know what I'm discovering after 58 years of being on planet Earth? I'm discovering that happy people, contented people, don't chase after more stuff. They chase after God, and it seems that happiness catches them. You know, genuinely happy, contented people, they're not chasing after bigger cars and bigger houses and more stuff. They chase after God, and somehow happy catches them. I mean, Isaiah, back in the Old Testament, brilliant. Isaiah nails it. He says this, why spend money on what doesn't satisfy? I mean, you can imagine Isaiah talking to God's people, almost pulling his hair out, saying, you are spending your life pursuing stuff that doesn't make you happy. You think it will, but it doesn't. The new car smell wears off pretty quickly. Why spend all your money on the stuff that doesn't satisfy? Why spend your wages and still be hungry? Because you've got no contentment. Listen to me, Isaiah says. Do what I say and you'll enjoy the best food of all. <laughs> you know, honestly, I... <laughs> I wonder sometimes whether God must look down on you and look down on me and just be amazed at how we wear ourselves out nine to five, six, seven days a week, chasing stuff that ultimately doesn't satisfy. So let me finish with this thought. You want to be happy. What if your happiness was more about a give than a get? What if that's where your happiness lay? It was more about generosity, more about what you gave than what you managed to chase after and get. What if that's where your happiness lies? What if the antidote to materialism was generosity? You know, in this book, The Law of Happiness, um, I love it because Henry Cloud, um, he tells the story about his little, I think she was about an eight-year-old daughter at the time. And uh, he said to her one morning just before school, while they were sat in the kitchen having breakfast, he said, Livia, he said, um, would you do a, a psychology experiment with me today? And she went, oh, yes, daddy, I'd love to do that. What do I have to do? So he said, OK, darling, what I need you to do is this. Here's your pack lunch. And he gave her a pack lunch. It had sandwiches, an apple, a little drink, a bag of crisps, and it had a Kit Kat in it. You know those Kit Kat bars where you, you break it and there are two little sticks? He said, when you get to school, when it gets to lunchtime, eat all your lunch, but save the Kit Kat till last. And then when you've eaten all your lunch, you've eaten your crisps and your sandwiches, you've drunk your drink, then get to your Kit Kat. And he said, I want you to break it in half, have one bar for yourself and give the other bar to a friend. Give the other bar to somebody else sat on a table near you. Give the other bar to a teacher if you want, but give it away to someone else. And we'll talk about what happens when you come home tonight. And he said he, <laughs> he said he was standing 
at the school gate at the end of the day, waiting to collect his daughter. And she came out of the school doors, running across the, pre- the playground, and she was saying, Daddy, 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 what was that? What happened? I felt this strange feeling in here. And she pointed to her heart. And he was able to explain to her, Olivia, joy, happiness, that warm feeling inside is because you were giving rather than getting. You know, I, this is amazing. Researchers, according to Henry Cloud's book, researchers have found that when we give, okay, when our lives involve generosity, when, it, when our lives involve sharing and serving other people, our entire bodily chemistry changes. In fact, Henry Cloud says, researchers on the brain have found that when you give, the same pleasure uh, centers are stimulated that get stimulated when you eat great food or have great sex. That's what Henry Cloud says. The same pleasure uh, centers get stimulated when you're generous, when you give, than when you eat a nice meal or you have great sex. I mean, in other words, there is tremendous rewards (laughs) in giving and in being generous generosity giving makes happy happen i mean paul knew this and so he writes to the corinthian church doesn't he paul and he says listen remember this i think this is the only time paul writes those two words remember this like jesus he knew the importance of money and he was trying to say to these corinthian christians if you forget everything else i teach you don't forget This, it's so important. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. You choose not to be generous, you won't find happiness rolling back your way. Whoever sows sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously, on the other hand, well, then they'll make happy happen. They'll reap generously. So let me ask you a really deep theological question. What's your Kit Kat? What is it God is asking you to share? Where is God asking you to be generous? Because that's where happy happens. And that's the thing that breaks our hold on our stuff. It's the antidote to materialism. I'll finish with this little picture. 1940s London, just at the end of the war, 1944 in London. London had taken a pounding from the German bombers. And there were lots of orphans running around the streets of London, around by the Thames. They lived under bridges. They scrabbled around for food. And there's a brilliant story told about one American serviceman at the end of the Second World War. And he walked around a corner of a London street just by a bakery. At exactly the same time, a little street urchin came the other way around the corner by the bakery. And it was at exactly the same time that the baker had just taken a dozen sticky buns juicy sweet sticky buns out of the oven and he puts the 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 buns in the shop window and the little hungry street urchin presses his nose up against the glass and he looks at these buns and he's thinking to himself i would love to fill my hungry belly with those sticky sweet buns but he didn't have any money he couldn't do it and the american service serviceman noticed this and he wanders into the bakery shop he hands over some money And the baker puts the buns in a bag and the serviceman takes them out and he sees this young lad and he tousles his hair and he gives him the complete and utter bag full of buns and says, there you go, sonny. And he walks off. And the little lad apparently followed after this American serviceman and he pulled on his jacket and the serviceman span around. He says, what can I do for you? And the little lad looked up at him and said, excuse me, sir, but are you God? You see, the the point of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is blatantly clear. You are never more like God than when you give. I mean, isn't that your passion as a Jesus follower? You want to be like the Jesus you're following? You are. People will think you're God when generosity and serving is part of who you are. So I don't think you can talk about a new relationship with money. Uh, without talking about the need to be generous, because I think it unlocks so much. You are never more like your heavenly father than when you're being generous. So I don't know whether you want to do this by splitting into groups and having conversations. I don't know whether that's something that you do as a church on these calls or whether you just want to jot these questions down and think about them at another time, talk about them with friends. But here are the, here are the uh, self-diagnostic questions that you need to ask 
an, an honestly answer if you want to have a new relationship with money. Do I really know where my money's going? What can you do this week to get a better picture of your financial incoming and outgoings? How do you, how can you monitor what you're spending your money on? I mean, there are a million different free apps you can download onto your phone that help you to keep a track of your spending. And you can just fill it in every time you buy a coffee or fill the car up with petrol and you'll know where your money's going. So do you really know? And what can you do to make sure you do that? Second question, what stuff are you holding on to that's holding you back? You know, is there anything that you need to throw overboard so that you can stay afloat financially? And third question, what about the people on this call? What about your friends? How can your friends help you to keep on track financially? That's how you have a new relationship with money. That's how you start to live the way Jesus intended you to live with a good relationship with money so that it doesn't become your master. He's your ruler. He's your master. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. I would be very happy to, 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 uh, to have questions if that helps. Um, I've left you my, um, you can find me on Instagram, look at Duncan Banks on Instagram, hit me up there and uh, we can carry the conversation on this week. I'd love to talk to you more. You know, just direct message me and we can have that conversation. Um, but I owe it's a, it's a huge privilege for me just to spend half an hour or so with, with your, you and your guys. And I hope this content's been helpful. And uh, please go ahead, take it from here. Thank you very much, Duncan. That's been amazing. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your generosity in sharing, you know, what you've learned over the years with us. Uh, very, very grateful. Um, the, the slides will be made available. So please, if you want to, um, feel free to email us at admin uh, at transformationhouse.org.uk and we will make the slides available. I will hand over to Ola and um, he would uh, take the announcements and just review what we've done. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Duncan. It's uh, great to see you again. And thank you for sharing that um, with us. It's, it's really been, been a blessing. Simple, simple steps, but um, very, very uh, profound. And they will work when we follow them. So thank you. Uh, we have a few, few announcements. Um, on Sunday, we, we're going to continue the series that we started um, called Hashtag Follow. So that's going to be concluding this Sunday. So you can join us at Transformation House in person or online uh, for this service. It, it was really great last Sunday. And um, we're just going to um, continue and follow up on that. Then next week, Wednesday, we're continuing our empowerment series. And um, the title for next week is Following Jesus Intentionally. And we have um, Chris Porter, who's going to be joining us for that session. Um, so uh, the Sundays we've been talking about following, and we're going to go deeper into how we can follow Jesus intentionally, um, because we're called, called to follow him. And when we do follow him, he will make us. So um, let's show up for that one as well. Um, and I think that's all the announcements we have. So thank you all so much for attend the service. Again, um, like Duncan said, if you do want the slides, we can share that with you. Um, send an email to admin at transformationhouse.org.uk. And also, if you have any questions, it's not too late to ask them. You can send that to um, admin at transformationhouse.org.uk, or you can follow Duncan on uh, his um, Instagram. Um, it's Duncan Banks um, on Instagram. So please go ahead and uh, follow him. Remember, we started talking about follow last week. So let's put some following into action and let's follow Duncan and ask more questions on this. Um, and uh, that's a reminder of, of the three questions to ask. Let's keep that in our mind. Let's uh, think it over. Let's answer them. Let's talk to our friends about it as well. Let's talk to our partners about it as well. And um, yeah, I think it will help us. So uh, thank you all so much once again for joining us. And we'll just say closing prayer as we round up tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. 
uh, because you are good always and you are so concerned, so interested in our well-being, even financially. And Father, as we saw um, today, Jesus, you know, did talk about the topic of finances and um, he, he, he brought out so many principles that could help us live a victorious life in, in, in the area of our finances. Father, we thank you for um, Duncan being with us tonight and sharing these simple truths with us. I pray that we will not just hear these words, but we'll go away, think about them, reflect on them, apply them, do them, because you said that the one that does your word um, is like a man that builds his house on a rock. Give us patience, give us some um, strength to follow these things through so that we might get the lasting change that we require in our lives. Thank you for everyone that joined us tonight. We're so grateful for everyone that showed up. And we pray that as we leave the call tonight, everyone leaves with a blessing. Everyone leaves with the presence of God. Everyone leaves with the wisdom of God imparted into their minds and into their lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much um, again for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you on Sunday and again next week, Wednesday. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and just say bye to everyone. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. And thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks, Duncan. Bye, Thanks, Duncan. Bye. Thanks, Duncan. Bye. Thanks, Duncan. Bye, everyone. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Bye, everyone. Thank you.